welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C., and it's the afternoon of July 11th, 2014, 150 years ago, right now, practically to the hour, the famished rebel horde of Jubal Early, the diehard lost cause commander and later ideologue, one of the people who did so much to perpetuate race hatred, Jim Crow, the Ku Klux Klan, and other similar institutions, well, he got to Fort Stevens in Washington, D.C., on Georgia Avenue, as we'll go through later in the show. He had been at Harper's Ferry on the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th, lost four days. He had then had to fight the Battle of the Monocacy River, south of Frederick, lost another day. He got to Gaithersburg, Rockville, by the uh, evening of the 10th, yesterday night, from 150 years ago. And on Friday the 11th, he got to Port Stevens. He did not go straight down Route 355 Wisconsin Avenue, because a very large fort barred that way. Uh, he thought he would have an easier time against Fort Stevens on Georgia Avenue. But on the way, because his troops were exhausted, worn out, no shoes, much dust, high temperatures, they also stopped to burn Silver Spring. Silver Spring was the mansion of the Blair family. These were Democrats, war Democrats, supportive of Lincoln, at least uh, to a significant degree. And they drank all the liquor and the wine cellar and everything else. So this is one of the reasons the Confederates were debilitated on July 11th. They took a position, the Confederates, uh, at the site of the unfortunately abandoned Walter Reed Army Hospital. And a little bit south of that hospital, there is a cemetery, Battlefield National Cemetery, which is a Civil War cemetery, and uh, for other purposes... And then they got almost to Fort Stevens. And at that moment, there were um, some invalids, some clerks, some uh, older soldiers, others, uh, various kinds of heavy artillery people from other, uh, other forts had come in. Probably, well, we can't say, but maybe not enough to hold the fort. But at the same time, the 6th Corps was landing at the Washington docks and beginning to march up Georgia Avenue towards Fort Stevens. And, of course, the problem that Early had, he might have wanted to attack when he got there around noon or 1 on the Friday afternoon, July 11th, 150 years ago, right now, as I'm speaking. But his command was strung out over many, many miles, and of course, a certain number of them had uh, had been tippling there in the uh, and burning the uh, the mansion. So he hesitated, and by the following morning, the twelfth of July, the sixth corps was in place, and the last hope of the Confederacy had gone a glimmering. The hope was burn Washington, and then use that to defeat Lincoln in the November eighteen sixty four election, arguing that uh, the war was impossible, that secessionism was an accomplished fact, and that slavery would be eternal. Slavery would be eternal was the Confederate uh, message, right? You even heard it, right? Slavery now, slavery then, slavery forever. That was their, their, their mantra. All right, so we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about the economic model of the Confederacy, why this was not viable, and what it teaches us about primitive accumulation economies, and low-wage economies in general. Let's look, however, at the uh, current world situation. Uh, it is an appalling uh, spectacle. Uh, it is the image of world civilization in a breakdown crisis. And we're now up to three wars, as well as countless social dislocations, and related crises. The three wars, of course, are, in order of descending importance, the Ukraine, first of all, where thermonuclear combat is never as far away as you'd like it to be, put it that way. Then you've got Syria-Iraq, now one front, thanks to the NATO-backed ISIS, own 
owned by Saudi Arabia, by uh, Prince Abdul Rahman Faisal, funded by Saudi Arabia and others in the Gulf, trained by U.S., British, and French instructors in a Jordanian camp. And you've also then got the Israeli, Gaza, Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. Let me just jump to the conclusion, which is, if you had a workable international security system built around a condominium of the United States and Russia, it would be possible to solve all of these questions in half an hour, primarily, by imposing a solution, by saying, Netanyahu, your history, Haniye, you're out of business, and there's going to be a solution here, and we'll tell you what it is, and you will, you will do that, because we're not going to blow up the entire world over your stupid uh, ideological uh, obsessions, right? And uh, remember, Haniye is uh, a- he's pro-Morsi and anti-Assad, so he doesn't win much credit with that kind of uh, chicanery, right? So what we've got then is this uh, breakdown. And then, of course, the immigration crisis of the U.S., and this, of course, simply underlines the fact that in vast parts of the world, you've now got deepening depression, a depression that's been going since 07, 08, getting worse, and you've now got a generation growing up in hopelessness, despair, no job prospects, no marriage prospects, no nothing, and those are the preconditions either for soldatesca, for rebels, as we see in many parts of the world, warlords, rebels, armed gangs, and or criminal gangs, drug running, and or mass refugee flows as world civilization collapses. I'd like to refer to an article here by Larry Summers here in the Washington Post, Monday, July 7th, the erosion of U.S. leadership. Yeah, fine, Larry, but U.S. leadership uh, can't be what you think it is. It can't be more free trade, more globalization, more bailouts, and so forth. It's got to be world economic recovery and world economic development. This is the ultimate only answer to this stuff. Right? Otherwise, you're running around, going from pillar to post, trying to shut down one crisis after another. They all have a common matrix. They all grow out of this tragic world economic depression, which could also be uh, defeated within a period of, of several weeks or several months with the right uh, policies. Read, Topley for Fedhead, Topley for Fedhead would, would be a good step along the way. That would start restoring uh, U.S. world leadership there, uh, Larry Summers. This is one of the main protagonists and designers of, uh, of globalization, along with James Baker III, who came out of uh, retirement today, uh, this past week, to write a, a series of obituaries for his unfortunate friend, Edward Shabatnatsa. And he said, the day the Cold War ended was in August uh, 1990, when Shabatnatsa joined Baker in denouncing Iraq for invading Kuwait and slapping on arms embargoes and other economic warfare measures. I'm sorry, that will not do it. But let's look at some of the details. Um, uh, first of all, in uh, Iraq, uh, Maliki is still defiant uh, and will not quit. The U.S. The U.S. argument continues to be, as I pointed out on Press TV, and you can see that item on Topsy.net. The U.S. line is: ISIS is the end of the world, chaos, delirium, and the, the collapse of everything. The, the literally the abyss, except, but. We won't lift a finger against them until we get rid of Maliki. And we've had all kinds of people trying to propagandize again that uh, Alawi really got 91 seats to the 89 for Maliki, and therefore Alawi is the man. Well, he's not the man. We'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. The afternoon of July 11, 2014, 150 years since the last gasp offensive of the Confederacy with Jubal Early and his band at uh, Fort Stevens. And remember that great quote from Frederick Douglass where he says, we are always asked to give equal honor and equal admiration to those who fought to destroy this country and to those who fought to save it. 
equal honor and equal admiration to those who fought to end slavery and those who fought to spread it around the world, or words to that effect. So we're not going to fall into that problem here, as I guess people know. So um, Maliki Defiant, ISIS uh, at the moment stalled. Remember, ISIS is actually very few people. They come through like a wave, and behind them they leave the rule of certain tribes or other pro-terrorist criminal drug running and other elements behind them. And woe to those civilians uh, that are there, right, because they then feel the lash of this uh, lunatic uh, system that uh, ISIS represents. And, of course, the Caliph of Baghdad, the Caliph of Baghdad is actually a French comic opera from the 19th century. The composer's name is escaping me at the moment. It begins with a B. And we heard selections from this played by the uh, Wildcat uh, Regimental Band, coming from Indiana, Pennsylvania, at the Harpers Ferry Battlefield last Saturday. They played the Caliph of Baghdad. It's an opera buffa. So I think there's a certain amount of opera buffa in this current character with his Rolex watch. He reminds me of Danny Ortega, the uh, great revolutionary with his uh, cool shades. But now, um, Maliki stays in power. The Kurds boycott. The Kurds are now on secession course. This was... One of the goals of the operation, to break up Iraq, to have those squabbling, impotent, petty states. If the Kurds secede, problem for Syria, problem for Turkey, problem for Iran. Concerning the problem for Iran, we've had David Ignatius gloating. Ignatius, the conduit for, uh, what can we say, the U.S. intelligence community, the State Department, and so on, gloating in the Washington Post that ISIS is mainly bad for Iran because it brings Sunni anti-Shiite terrorists to the uh, to the uh, border of of um, Iran, and it also threatens them with breakup as a result of the um, the problem with um, the problem with uh, the the Kurds that we've just mentioned. So uh, there we are. ISIS hurts. Iran mainly gloats Ignatius, right? So another good reason not to do anything about it, even though, of course, they're the end of the world. Um, Gnome Chomsky has uh, written uh, something about this now. He's, he's come out of his dogmatic slumbers, and he dis he's now aware that there is such a thing as a Nuremberg indictment, which we have uh, pointed out here on many occasions. Maybe, maybe I flatter myself, maybe he's polemicizing with me, that there is such a thing as Nuremberg indictment, that it involves the international conspiracy to wage aggressive war as the top war crime that you could be uh, accused of, class A uh, war criminal. But then he says, no, it's a mistake to issue Nuremberg indictments, because that's not the real issue anymore. Now somehow it becomes something vague in the future. Uh, with and, and of course, uh, Gnome wants to oppose fracking. He seems to think that fracking is the main issue in the world. Well, we're against fracking. We're in favor of modern energy production, nuclear and thermonuclear at the most modern level. Fracking, of course, a blind alley. It's a low-technology cul-de-sac. You go in there, you won't come out. It's a trap. It traps you in backward technology and deprives you of the capital you need for really modern stuff. But Gnome uh, wants to use that as a substitute because his fundamental pessimism is oozing from every pore. So um, that's the Iraq situation. Now, really more important in terms of the world, I think import, more important by far, Ukraine. Now, we've just had an incident of big losses by the Ukrainian soldateska. You can't tell whether it's army or right sector rebaptized as National Guard. 30 dead, and a big uh, brouhaha coming from Poroshenko, the Chocolate King. Uh, Poroshenko is now into Hitlerian rhetoric. Uh, this is the the rhetoric of Lidice, or the Fosse Ardeatine near Rome. He says, for every one of our glorious heroes who falls, we will exact a penalty of 10 to 1 or 1,000 to 1. That's worth a Nuremberg indictment right there, Gnome and Poro. So um, 
we we note uh, what I think we mentioned last week that Cohen has uh, deplored the silence of the U.S. hawks concerning the atrocities being carried out by Kiev. They, the, the Kiev hawks have been carrying out, Kiev Nazis have been carrying out atrocities all week. And Cohen, to his credit, does discuss something about the, um, the, uh, the, the question of, uh, of fascism, right, that the Kiev people are fascist. However... Let us point out one thing. Uh, the terrain, if I were advising Putin, as uh, would be good if, if, if I could, I would say to him, Putin, look, uh, not so much in Ukraine is the key to this situation, but in following the advice of Glaziev, that is to say, you've already been hit by sanctions. You can retaliate now. You're, you're afraid of more sanctions? Make it clear what you'll do. Any more sanctions... All all loans will be defaulted on, repudiated. Nothing will be paid. You'll dump all U.S. Treasury securities. You'll go to capital controls, exchange controls. You'll seize control of the Russian central bank, start issuing long-term, low-interest, zero-interest credit for infrastructure, agriculture, manufacturing, commercial activities, and everything else that adds up to a real economy, not for derivatives, not for financial services. That's the area where Putin really needs to oppose and confront the West. If you get into this question of Ukraine, and then where do you draw the line, you may have to do that anyway. But the only way that can succeed in Ukraine is if you've got this general framework of bringing down the globalization system. Because as I said at the beginning, the globalization system has failed, and its failures have names. The Iraq-Syria situation, the Ukraine situation itself is a product of economic collapse. And, of course, <laughs> look, uh, the, what's the unemployment rate in Gaza? 50%. Well, they're under siege. Okay, why are they under siege? Because that helps Netanyahu. Why does it help Netanyahu? Because in Israeli politics, remember the no future generation? Remember the uh, poverty rates among Israeli children? In other words, it all hangs together. If you follow the causal chains, you'll eventually get to the fact that we are in a breakdown crisis. Remember that fateful triple rhythm, depression, dictatorship, and war. But the depression is what comes first. Treat the depression, and you can avoid the other two. If you don't, you won't avoid either one. So we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. The bulletin from New York State this week is brief. It is that uh, Credico has sent his signatures, uh, almost uh, 2,000 pages of signatures. These have now been submitted to the New York State Board of Elections, and the question is what will happen next. There had been a threat from the Cuomo camp that if Credico came in with anything fewer than 2,000 pages of signatures, right, implying about 20,000 individual signatures on the 2,000 pages, 10 per page, more or less, uh, that Cuomo would consider a challenge. Now, the challenge, the line-by-line -line challenge is extraordinarily expensive, and of course, these would be Gestapo tactics in New York State, and uh, I can tell you all about the history of these things, but you get the idea. So, um, we wish uh, all success to the Credico campaign. He's running on the Wall Street sales tax. You've heard him on here. And uh, don't forget him, Credico 2014. Uh, this is an important front. It's m important to maintain it. And uh, it's a great alternative to Cuomo, Zephyr Teachout, and Howie Hawkins to have Credico, who is a much more radical critique of Cuomo than either of those other two, who are comparatively, I'm afraid, weak sisters. So now, um, Ukraine. Um, it was a, a big week, and this was a, a big uh, day. Whatever, Cuomo, whatever Putin does tactically around Lugansk and Donetsk, he's got to think about the, the, the um, Glaziev recommendations. Uh, and concerning this, we've just had a call from France, from Germany, and from Putin uh, to restore the ceasefire, which had been in force. 
the theory is that there's a lot of pressure on Putin inside Russia to act militarily um, in order to deal with this situation. And again, that, that has to be decided on its own merits. I just stress again, without the anti-globalization offensive, nothing else will work. So do the best you can tactically, but strategically you've got to have the attack on globalization, which is now a failure in the eyes of the world. Now, um, this thing about U.S. spying in Germany, what could this be? Um, well, um, the big uh, news, you know, we don't have a much, we don't have much of a good opinion of, uh, of Madame Merkel here, but uh, in terms of the German government, um, the fact is that they seem to represent, in the particular behind the scenes, a break on the um, elan of the American uh, warmongers and neocons, on the Newlands and Piats and, uh, and people like this, Susan Rice and so forth. Uh, is it far-fetched to think that the CIA was tapping uh, her phone and indeed planting these uh, molds inside the uh, BND or whatever this was uh, in order to uh, be able to counter what Merkel might be doing on Ukraine, um, she said, Merkel says, well, it's superfluous, it's wasted effort to spy on an ally. Yes, of course, but uh, in this case, uh, there may be something cooking. Um, if, there's any, if there are any brain cells left in Germany, which is a place which in the past, of course, has exercised uh, considerable positive influence even on uh, world intellectual uh, development at various times, right? It's enough to say Beethoven to uh, to win that argument. Um, considerable imp positive influence, no no doubt about it. Uh, if there are any brain cells left today, <clears throat> after all that stultification and the catastrophes of the 20, 20th century, maybe uh, some kind of grand design and grand dessin might emerge uh, with uh, the German-Russian combination, right, which is such a combination of potential that it um, it would uh, allow a, a, an effective resistance, let's say, against London and uh, and Wall Street. Uh, just since we're on these, uh, well, we better come. We're going to do Greenwald. We'll have to come back to Greenwald now. Concerning the Israelis, uh, the cynicism of the Israeli generals is that they refer to this as mowing the lawn. That is to say, every couple of years, 2006, they tried mowing the lawn, and they got a bloody nose. Uh, 2008, during the U.S. Bush to Obama interregnum, they tried it again, tried it again two years ago. It's mowing the lawn. Now, there are two sides. On the one hand, the rocket coverage by Hamas of, uh, of the main Israeli population centers is growing thanks to that Fajr missile from Iran. They can now at least aim at almost 100 percent, certainly more than 90 percent of the Israeli population, right? Not just Tel Aviv, but also Haifa, way up north. Haifa used to worry about the rockets coming from Lebanon in uh, 20, uh, 2006. So uh, there is that. There's also that Netanyahu obviously fears the ground war, right? You send tanks and troops into Gaza, there will be losses, right? They, they've gotten some stuff across the, uh, the border. On the other hand, the unfortunate nature of the Hamas leadership is what I pointed out before, right? This Haniye is a very dubious character. Can you imagine he supports the Syrian terrorist rebels against Assad, and he supports Morsi? Morsi, who was about to bring Egypt into a war with Assad, in which Gaza would have been a battlefield in the middle of a bloodbath if they were lucky? No, I'm sorry. No confidence in Haniye and uh, Hamas. And remember, I, I, I only bring this up because of what Haniye is doing today. Hamas was founded by Sharon, as everybody knows, right? He promoted them as a counterweight to the more uh, rational uh, PLO. PLO has its own problems, corruption, and uh, and everything else. Um, so here we have it. Uh, the Egyptians. The the other the problem, of course, uh, is that uh, General Sisi and company view Hamas as a sponsor of terrorism in the Sinai, and I imagine they're exactly right. So there's a problem, right? That the the, the blockade of uh, of Gaza is now 
not just the Israelis, but now more more openly by the Egyptians than ever uh, in the past. So um, this is the the situation, and of course the 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 Iron Dome works up to a point, but unfortunately, based on news accounts, you can't tell how well it's uh, how well it's working. I guess the the count. Uh, the casualty count indicates that Iron Dawn is having some effect in favor of the uh, Israelis. Now, what should happen? It, and a settlement will have to be imposed. I'm sorry, we cannot leave this to these petty politicians. There's not one of them that has the format of a statesman. So everybody knows what it is. It's a Palestinian state, independent, sovereign, in the 67 borders. Then there are the two, well, three. There's the status of Jerusalem, this can be finessed. And then the uh, question of the borders, well, the borders we've done, but the, um, the right of return, on the one hand, for the Palestinians, and the settlers who will have to be displaced to dismantle many of these settlements. I say that these can also be negotiated, and they can be solved through indemnification. In other words, by paying considerable sums of money to Palestinians who may not be able to go back to Israel, must understand this, and to settlers who, for sure, will have to leave, many of them will, uh, the Palestinian territories, unless agreed-on swaps can be arranged, but they've gone too far with the settlements. This can no longer be done. I suggest the European Union (laughs) come forward with a lot of this money, along with the U.S. There would also be necessary security guarantee for Israel and a probable and, and a security guarantee for the Palestinian state too. That's why it could be done by the U.S. and Russia and a peacekeeping force to make sure that that sticks. At that point, Haniyeh would be out of business. Netanyahu, Avigdor Lieberman, every one of these demagogues out of business, and the world peace would take a giant step forward. Why not take this opportunity instead of petty quarrels? Back in a minute. Welcome back to uh, World Crisis Radio. Webster Topley here in um, in Washington D.C. Hey, they say that Romney may run, right? The top Mormon ideologue, Jason Chaffetz, says that Romney is sure to run for the presidency. Well, get ready. Time to get your copy if you haven't already of Just Too Weird, my study of uh, Mormon uh, history, and that's. Um, Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion, the Mormon Takeover of America, published uh, right before the presidential election 2012. I would also say, if you are interested in Civil War history, if you saw the lecture on the Sand Creek Massacre, that is the name, that is the lecture, that's the title of the lecture, the Sand Creek Massacre, um, at the Gettysburg College Civil War Institute, the summer uh, yearly Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College, you would have seen on C-SPAN a lecture about that Sand Creek Massacre. You've got to get just too weird, because this allows you to put these events into an actual historical context. And I deplore that the lecturer on this topic failed to refer to the fact that uh, Brigham Young and company were attempting to foment a general war by all tribes in the Great Basin and beyond against the United States, against the United States, and that uh, things that were done that might not make sense otherwise or might be difficult to interpret can be understood much better if you realize what Brigham Young was doing. And, of course, it's important to note that a lot of Indian tribes said, no, we don't want the Mormons, we want the Americans, we don't want... Brigham Young, we want uh, the government in in Washington. Mormons, no. Americans, yes. That was from many Indian tribes. And then uh, after some military operations by General Connor, the liberator of Utah, the Roman Catholic born in Ireland who uh, took the measure of the blustering bully Brigham Young, uh, that, uh, that entire thing uh, calmed down. So this was... 1858, 1857-58, 59, went together with Brigham Young's secession declaration and the uh, Mountain Meadows massacre of the Fancher Party going from Arkansas to California by Brigham Young and company. 
the prophet. All right, so that's the um, the the Middle East situation. I think we um, we have it. One other thing now, just this Greenwald. Uh, Greenwald is now obviously the successful limited hangout entrepreneur for his magazine Intercept, where he's ensconced with uh, Laura Poitras, uh, with the money coming from Omidyar, who also funds the destabilization of Ukraine, democracy, of course. Uh, Greenwald now has 7,500 emails on a spreadsheet, and he has decided to release five of those names. Greenwald, release all names. And I think even uh, uh, Assange, attempting to claw his way back into the spotlight, has called attention to this fact, right? This is now, Greenwald is a for-profit entrepreneur who is dribbling out this information. This is his capital. This is all he has. These are the leaks that he has. He doesn't do analysis. He does leaks. He repeats what, what, what he's found in these papers. So he writes long-winded articles. If there are 7,500 names on the spreadsheet approximately, then about 7,495 are still owed to us, and we want them now, and we don't want Greenwald picking and choosing what comes out. This is the idiotic uh, contradiction of this entire thing. He's using this stuff to to uh, make money. Now, let's look at this breakdown of civilization, and in particular, this question of the, um, the uh, immigration Crisis. First of all, let me say this: as as such events go, this is not a big refugee crisis. It's a refugee crisis, but not a big one. Think if you're, uh, you know, apart from the political guilt or not. Think if you're uh, Jordan, and you have what a million people from Syria coming across your border, and you have a population of what six, seven, eight million. Uh, that's something serious. Now, of course, what these other countries do is they build camps and they put the refugees into camps. This is not uh, the uh, American way. And here's what I would say. First of all, the inescapable premise here is that this is caused by the Depression, the breakdown crisis which hits Central America in this particular way. And it's got a lot to do with the U.S. narcotics market, which, of course, is now getting bigger thanks to Colorado and, uh, and Washington doesn't do anything to uh, to legalize things in these other places, so uh, we can count on this problem getting worse. But then the question is, you got all these uh, these kids, right? Pe- when you've got young boys and young men from 15 to 25, no job, no marriage, no hopes, no prospects, no nothing, despair. Well, according to the prevailing local ideology, they're going to be recruited for something or other. In the Middle East, they join... Uh, the jihadis, they join uh, ISIS, they join the Nusra Brigade, whatever they join. They go after Gaddafi, uh, they be, they work for the Benghazi Rebel Council, whatever it is. Uh, Honduras, Guatemala, Salvador, these places, the idea is, well, you've got to try to to become a refugee to the U.S. Uh, it's, it's a plausible uh, argument. Uh, there are no jobs in the home country. There's no infrastructure in the home country. Now, it's not a huge crisis. It's, uh, if it's 75000 a year, 100000 a year, a country of $310 million or whatever it is, this is hardly a crisis. If it's a million going into a country of $7 million, that's a crisis. That's a serious crisis. But in this case, I don't think it is. But now, the background. Remember what I've told you many times. Most countries in the world have a crisis of underpopulation. They have a demographic crisis of no growth. They are negative population growth. Russia is famous for having negative population growth. They claim it's getting better. I hope it is. Japan, maybe the oldest population in the world at this point and not being replaced. China, because of their foolish Malthusian, British-inspired one child per family, they've also got a demographic uh, gap opening up. Europe, with the cultural pessimism and historical pessimism that we've cataloged, population declining. Even in southern European Catholic countries, Italy, notably Spain, 
population declining. So uh, the United States stands alone as an established economic power that does not suffer this demographic crisis. Why? Because of the willingness of people from the Western Hemisphere particularly to come to the United States and work. This is a huge national Trump card. Whatever else you do, you don't want to lose that Trump card. You don't want to antagonize, alienate, reject those people. That is one of your key assets in the competition among these various uh, zones of the world. The other thing to point out is that who are these people who are coming? How foreign are they, after all? Well, they're all from Western civilization, right? They represent Roman Catholic Latin Christianity. Not that different. They represent an Indo-European language, not just an Indo-European, but a European language, Spanish, right? Spanish, like French, one of the languages ultimately closest to English. So the problem of uh, assimilation does not run up against insuperable problems. Now, of course, any time you have people from peasant societies coming, that will pose problems, and that will be the case here, too. But still, compared to other immigrations in the past, or uh, immigrations going into Europe or other parts of the world, this is a relatively easy one. My, my motto, again, is learn Spanish or learn Chinese. Spanish is easier, and you'll be talking in a normal conversation. If you wait to learn Chinese later, you'll be taking orders. So don't do it. Now, we'll talk more about this because we've got the problem of assimilation and the labor market, and we've got the problem of driving down wages and the countermeasures that are necessary because there are legitimate beefs involved. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. It's Friday, the 11th of uh, July. And we're going to take you now to uh, one of the main fighting fronts in the anti-fascist struggle, and that's Benton Harbor, Michigan, and our good friend, Reverend Edward Pinkney. And, Reverend, welcome. I understand you have uh, news of, of new outrages and new oppressions on the legal front. Why don't you fill us in? Absolutely, absolutely. Since the last time uh, I was on your show, I have been to court three different times. And uh, each time to have the bindover squashed. Unfortunately, uh, the, the judge ruled once again. Can you hear me? We just lost the sound, Reverend. All right. Uh, you got to come, come back. back. Come back to the phone. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? That's fine now. Stay on, stay, keep it like that, and we'll hear you fine. All right. Very good. What happened was that uh, I went to court three times. The first time to have the, uh, the, the bond over squashed. And, uh, because we, there Reverend, was, you're, you're, you're going to lose some of us. Um, to have what quashed? The, the bond over for trial. The bond and, over, okay. So in other words, to the, in, the indictment, I guess we'd the say. The indictment, uh, they call it an indictment. We call this bond over or bond okay. over for, for, for trial. And, and what happened was that during the process, uh, we became, uh, uh, they ruled, that it can't, it can't be, that can't, it can't be done. Okay. Yeah. So, he, uh, uh, so the, so the judge ruled that you don't need evidence uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to actually uh, bond somebody over for trial, which is not true. So their main focus was to try to find a way to, to, to send me to jail without any evidence. They're hoping for a, a jury that's motivated by something other than the truth so they can so they can send me to jail so it, it's been good on so uh, this is this is a this an outrageous frame up saying that we can put you on trial and we in the evidentiary hearing no evidence needs to be shown we're just going to say put him on trial force him to go on trial uh-huh absolutely and that that's the whole plan so what we are now we are now in the appeal court uh we filed on yesterday uh, to be in the appeal court, and we're going to let them make a decision uh, whether you need evidence or not to bond somebody over for trial. So Which, it, of course, I think you, you do, right, in theory. Oh, absolutely. It, under you law, have you do. Evidence. There's, there's no question about it. Probable it, cause, right? Probable cause. That is correct again. And you got to have a... Uh, 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 
Yes, Reverend. Yeah. So you got to have you you know you got to have evidence in order to get it done. So that's that's what it's all about. So that's a that's the uh, that's the court of appeals. And when do you go there? Well, we're already there, so we're waiting for them to make a, a decision whether we're going to have a, a stay or not, or whether the trial is going to begin July 21st. And maybe we, we should remind everybody listening in that this is a frame-up based on the fact that you were circulating petitions to get a recall against the mayor who had been installed there in Benton Harbor, Michigan. The guy's a puppet of Whirlpool Corporation, and he was put in there as an austerity enforcer under this emergency manager law, which should not be there because it was voted down, but Governor Snyder repassed it uh, cynically a couple of weeks after the people had said no. Absolutely. On the, on the Public Act 4, uh, uh, we, we, we rescinded that. one. matter of fact, we went out and got, the, uh, got everything we needed to make sure that that happened. So it was, it was very, very successful. But unfortunately, it all leads up to this. That's what's going on right now. So we're, we're fighting this thing like, you know, like tooth and nails. We're not giving them a chance to move. We're going to stay focused and do what we need to do. And when do you think you get the word uh, on their decision in this current well, phase? Uh, we're going we're gonna to pick the jury on the 17th, which is next Thursday. So I'm nice. hoping that we get it by then. I, I, I'm looking at Monday or Tuesday. And that would shut down the process leading to a trial. Absolutely, you absolutely. I, I, I believe that we're, we're going to win it, win it in the appeal court. Matter of fact, uh, I think they're going to dismiss all charges, but if not, we'll be ready for trial. Okay. The other thing that occurs to me is you can try interlocutory appeals That's you know, exactly on the spot where we're at to, now. to higher level courts. Absolutely. That's where we're at now, at higher level court. We're at the uh, uh, state, state, uh, state court, uh, appeal court. That's where we're at right now. Okay. But we, we're doing great. We're doing great. We just, you know, we're just fighting this war, just staying focused, and not getting sidetracked. Okay, and I, so people are in good spirits. Do you have any events planned? Well, uh, one of the things we, we're going to have a rally uh, next Saturday, uh, right before the trial, and just take it to another level and deal with it on, deal with it on that level. But we're still fighting back. Uh, I have a uh, petition on uh, change.org, and you simply key in Reverend Pinckney and sign that petition. Okay, change.org, mm -hmm. and you correct me, but Pinckney is P-I-N-K-N-E-Y. That is correct. Reverend Pinckney, P-I-N-K-N-E-Y, on change.org, and sign the petition against this outrageous uh, this miscarriage of justice, right? What can we call it? Yeah. Frame up. Absolutely. And, it, you know, it, it's going to continue whether people know it or not. It's going to be in your community next. Okay, so this is a rally on Saturday, the 19th of July in Benton Harbor, Michigan. That is correct. All right. So if you're within uh, any distance of that, it's time to go over there and make your voice heard. And, also and then, even... Reverend, tell us how, if, if uh, all these legal bills, what can people do? To help. Hey, Give us your contact information and absolutely. the Banco Those website. Those of you who would like to leave a donation, you can go to bhbanco.org. And I have a PayPal there where you can just key in and also uh, contribute. Or you can mail a check to Banco, B-A-N-C-O, 1940 Union Avenue, Benton Harbor, Michigan, 49022. Or you can call me at 269-925. Zero, 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 one. Okay. So 1940 Union Avenue, Benton Harbor, Michigan. And what was the zip again? 49022. 49022. I urge people to do it because this, again, is the front line of uh, defense. Uh, you know, you can't even, you can't run for office. You can't uh, have a referendum or a recall or anything if you're not allowed to circulate these uh, petitions, right, to get the signatures. And that is what correct. somebody and seems to be aiming at. Any reactions from this mayor? Well, you know, uh, there's another recall on him right now as we speak. Uh -huh. And uh, they're ga gathering signatures and uh, making sure they're doing the right thing. And uh, we're giving the sheriff's department another opportunity to come and surround my home. That's what we're going to do. You know, we're going to make sure that we're going to let them know that they don't intimidate me. And I'm not going to allow them to intimidate me 
uh, with the police force, with the squad team, or whatever they want to do. That is not going to happen. And again, this is the unelected mayor, right? The mayor who has been imposed under this banker's dictatorship. Am I right? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And he's and he, he's with him. He's with that Whirlpool Corporation, sucking the life out of the residents here in the city of Benton Harbor. That's amazing. So he wants a company town, and the opposition centers on you. Absolutely. Somebody well, got to stand up to him. That's what I do. This sounds like Pottersville, right, in The Wonderful Life. He wants Absolutely. to have Pottersville, and there's an opposition. Absolutely. You know, it's always going to be something. So, you know, the most important thing, we stay focused, do the things that need to be done, and just take this thing to a whole different level. Very good. And don't obviously don't get discouraged and don't don't think that this, uh, this whole process is going to stand up, because uh, if you do the right things, it won't. All Absolutely. right, Reverend. Hey, listen, uh, uh, really appreciate, appreciate you allowing me to be on your show. And we will talk soon. Yes, by all means. And so, and don't again, get the, to encourage people to go through my uh, and sign my petition at change.org. Just key in Reverend Pinkney. Okay, change.org, P I N K N E Y. And the rally is in Benton Harbor on the 19th of July. That's right, at City Hall. At City Hall, okay. And we'll we'll see you soon, Reverend. We'll keep up with you. We'll get you on next week. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Top here in Washington, D.C. We're recording on the afternoon of Friday, July 11th, 2014. And now we want to go to Nebraska, right? This is the second part of our vast panorama of struggle uh, department here on the uh, World Crisis Radio Show. And now we're going to get uh, a report from uh, Dan Burdorf, candidate for the Tax Wall Street Party. He's running for United States Senate in the state of Nebraska, and his opponent is the very dubious and now, I would say, embattled Ben Sass, who uh, is trying to dodge a bunch of very embarrassing questions about his past, at the same time that Ben Sass is trying to ram a reactionary austerity program down the throats of uh, Nebraska voters and become their senator in um, in Washington, even though, for example, Sass is somebody whose religious affiliations go to groups uh, who argue that the Pope is the Antichrist. Pope Francis would be the Antichrist, according to the leaders of Sass's uh, religious affiliation, and nevertheless he's got uh, about a quarter to a third of the voters in Nebraska, actually Roman Catholics, uh, who are obviously going to be, I think, deeply troubled by Sass's religious uh, connections. But let's go to Lincoln, Nebraska, and bring on Dan Burdoff. Dan, welcome. Hello, Webster. Can you hear me? Yes, everything's fine. Wonderful. Webster, thanks very much for having me on your show. It's always a pleasure, uh, Dan. Anytime, every time, uh, every week. For sure. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, I, I wanted to tell you that this program is working here in Nebraska. Our program, the Tax Wall Street Party program, this, this program is appealing across the board. As I'm seeing on the ground, I'm going to uh, neighborhoods in Omaha and out west in Nebraska. Uh, we're getting. Uh, um, I'm sorry, there's an echo on the phone, but I'll just keep going. Keep going because it sounds fine yes, from sir. here. Okay. Well, uh, we're getting. Uh, Plenty of uh, experience in uh, middle class areas and working uh, working class areas in Nebraska, and uh, we're pushing the program. I'm the only tax Wall Street Party candidate in this election cycle that's pushing the whole program, and I, I want people to uh, help me with this because uh, we're having a, a chance to restore America right here in the heartland. The cornerstone of my program, as you know, is a one percent Wall Street sales tax, and what we're going to do is we're going to move the tax burden off of middle class and working people and onto Wall Street because they pay no tax right now. And we're going to do that with this innovative program called the, the 1% the 1 Wall Street Sales Tax, and it's targeted at derivatives. And uh, we're going to use this to wipe out derivatives that caused the 2007 crisis and at the same time provide enough revenue to stop any cuts to the social safety net. So no, no cuts to grandma's Medicare, no cuts to veterans' benefits, et cetera, across the board. And uh, this is really appealing to a lot of people. And the other cornerstone of my program, as you know, this is the same program that we 
developed in the UFAA and attacked Wall Street Party for years. We're, we're doing the uh, infrastructure redevelopment, bringing it up from a D grade to an A grade. We're going to do that with. Uh, we're going to do that with. Uh, sorry, I got an echo again, but um, we got. Uh, we're going to Just hold, hold the receiver in front of your mouth and don't even listen. Just talk. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Webster. We're going to do that with uh, uh, direct financing from the Federal Reserve at zero percent. We're going to have a hundred-year bonds. The Fed's going to act like a national bank. So we're going to mobilize the Fed to act like a national bank, and we're going to create uh, national uh, uh, bonds for states and municipalities to redevelop their infrastructure, bring it into the 21st century. We also have a plan, of course, to uh, protect uh, American industries with protective tariffs and put a, a, a ground a safety net under farmers with a parity pricing. We're also dropping the – my, my plan also calls for dropping the uh, 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 age of Medicare – from 65, take that out so we can have Medicare for all, $100 per person per month. If they can't afford it, we're going to supplement that with the Wall Street sales tax. So none of this is happening on budget, and or and if we're paying for it with taxes, it's going to be moving the tax burden away from the middle class and working people and onto Wall Street. We're also going to mobilize the Federal Reserve to act like a national bank with uh, loans to students at 0.75. And we're also talking about a global peace race, so we're going to stop our... Uh, color coups around the world, and we're going to have a peace race with these countries so that if China builds a mile of high-speed rail, we can, we're going to build uh, two miles of high-speed rail. In fact, we're going to build high-speed rail from New York to Los Angeles right through Omaha and Lincoln. And Webster, that's why I'm, I'm appealing to your audience to help me at danfornebraska.com and uh, to look me up at Facebook forward slash danfornebraska and Twitter at danfornebraska. And uh, support me on my uh, website, danfernebraska.com. And uh, you can also reach me at Friends of Dan Bergdorf, Eagle Box 6584, Lincoln, Nebraska 68506. And I, I, I have to appeal to the, to the listeners, Webster, because we're testing this program on the street in working class neighborhoods and middle class neighborhoods in eastern Nebraska, in Lincoln, and Omaha, and in western Nebraska. And we're working this month on districts two and three. And Nebraska is a huge state, as anyone who can look at a map can see. And uh, this is Omaha area and all of western Nebraska and the very southern portion of, of uh, Nebraska. And we're really excited uh, to move into western Nebraska and test this program deep in conservative traditional districts. Uh, we're happy. They're having very good results, and the people are very receptive. And our team is uh, making a lot of sacrifices and taking off from work and spending time away from their loved ones and sacrificing sleep to test this program in Nebraska. And the uh, home, Nebraska, of course, is the home of the, the populist movement. So uh, I really, we really could use some more help. I know uh, we're having a, one of our uh, good friends, uh, Thomas Mann, or I'm sorry, excuse me, Thomas Mars is coming up from Texas this weekend, and we're looking forward to meeting him. And we have some other people coming in from around the country to help us. But I want to say special thanks to UFAA founding member Joe Johnson, who has been out every day getting signatures with me, and it's all about man hours, and if we can get uh, people on the ground, we will be very successful. Uh, Dan, a couple of things. Now, you, you go yes, into sir. these neighborhoods. You, you're the tax Wall Street party. I'm guessing yes, that some of these neighborhoods, it would be hard for a Democrat to go there after all the betrayals of people like Senator Ben Nelson, Democratic senator from Nebraska, and I'm thinking yeah. of um, earlier ones, right, right-wing Democrats who really, really – Tended to sell the state out, but the the tax Wall Street party has a has a better fighting chance. I think so. I, I, we do have a, a, a good chance with our program. I think this program is a fighting program. That's why I chose to run on it. I think this is, gives uh, identifies the the problems in our economy and identifies solutions to actually solve these problems. And and as you said, some of these past uh, representatives from Nebraska haven't identified the problems adequately and haven't addressed them. But I, I also wanted to, to talk about the sacrifice that we're asking people to make here, not just ourselves on our team, but also the listeners. If you could help us a little bit, it would be very helpful. Okay, because, uh, and they will. And it's Dan for Nebraska. Nebraska. That's the music. We're out of time. We'll see you next week, Dan. DanfornNebraska.com. I'll repeat it in the next segment. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Topley in Washington, D.C. So it's danfornebraska.com. 
and there you'll also find the uh, the mailing address and other ways to get in touch. The the uh, groups of people that are going out to get the signatures are becoming somewhat more numerous in the coming days. So uh, we have every hope to get uh, Dan on the uh, ballot so that he can challenge SAS and the uh, the ineffectual, feckless uh, Democrat Domina, a labor lawyer, uh, obviously a profession that has not had too many wins lately, right? They may be doing something wrong. I think they are, that uh, Dan could be doing right. And uh, to be in the tax Wall Street party means you've got a chance where a Democrat wouldn't after people like Bob Kerry and Ben Nelson, as I mentioned. And then there's the question of the uh, the Federal Reserve. One of the things that we could have talked about is that uh, once you've seized the Federal Reserve, you've got this trillion dollars of student loans, right? And, and I think some of that really should be canceled. But whatever else you do with it, it's easy to get all the interest rates down to practically zero. And Elizabeth Warren had been moving in this direction slightly more than a year ago, May of last year, she wanted to force the Fed to provide the money at 0.75%, less than 1%, three-quarters of 1% interest rate, uh, out of the discount window. In other words, if the banks could borrow at that rate, then individual students could borrow at that rate. Elizabeth Warren is now in full retreat. The bill she's pushing now gets that student loan interest rate up to about 3.5%. That's too much. That interest rate is too damn high. To coin a phrase, too damn high. So, um, Elizabeth Warren, uh, we have this brouhaha this week that, um, according to Ed Klein of the New York Post, Obama wants to play Elizabeth Warren against Hillary because uh, the thesis is that Elizabeth Warren represents the continuity of Obama's policies against Hillary. Well, um, bad as Elizabeth Warren uh, actually is, She's better than Obama, so much so that when Elizabeth Warren was able to secure the founding of this rather modest Consumer Finance Protection Agency, in other words, if you're going to be hit by usury, you should be able to read the fine print. Great. Uh, That's sort of the petty bourgeois good government uh, approach to this stuff. Well, she, she wanted to be the head of the Consumer Finance Protection Agency. Obama wouldn't let her do it. He put in this current guy who is, um, I think, less effective than Warren might have been. So the, this Ed Klein thesis that somehow Warren represents the continuity of Obama, no, Hillary would be much closer to Obama, except that Hillary has not learned this fundamental lesson of warmongering, because Hillary now says, oh, I was wrong on Iraq, but now it's time to bomb Syria. I'm sorry, with that, you haven't learned a damn thing. So that is no good. But now let's um, let's consider what we had going about uh, immigration. As I said, the main problem in the world is most developed countries or even developing countries like China have a demographic uh, crisis. But in the case of the Chinese, it's somewhat self-inflicted with this Malthusian business that they embraced, right? Always poison for a polity. Uh, gobernar es poblar. It's not the opposite, right? To to govern is to populate, not to depopulate. And that was what the uh, Deng Xiaoping people didn't quite uh, get. But now we've got to think about uh, when people come here as immigrants, right? And they will continue to do so. And again, this is a big advantage. You've got a, you've got a problem of assimilation. This is a labor market problem. Uh, assimilation is not working as well as it did, right? The melting pot to create this new amalgam, which is not identical to any pre-existing ethnic group. It's informed principally by political ideas. But in order to do this, you've got to have a, a functioning labor market. And the best way, of course, is to be at or near full employment. The only way to do this is what Dan Burdoff was talking about, seize the Fed, get that credit-creating power working, Credit creation for job creation, 30 million new industrial jobs at union wages, productive jobs at union wages, also in agriculture, mining, scientific research, and so on down the line. Then at that point, you'll have a self-sustaining recovery, and you'll have new uh, cohorts of all kinds of people being brought into the labor force uh, and being able to then assimilate to a kind of a 
uh, a ma- mainstream or melting pot uh, approach, uh, making it attractive, making it uh, a, a good a good thing that people will want to take part in it. They won't have to be coerced, right? Remember, there are three ways to do this. The Prussian way is everybody gets Prussianized, whether they like it or not. And that may work for a while, but ultimately, as we see, it doesn't work. Then there's the Austrian way, which is to cultivate the particularism of everybody. Saying, oh, the emperor wants you to develop every one of you. Your individual particularities are so important to us. It's a divide and conquer strategy. We have something like that going on right now, right? Multiculturalism is that. American way, melting pot, assimilate to a successful, dynamic labor market with rising standards of living, full employment, and uh, all kinds of avenues of opportunity and interest and education for the individual. Now, the other side of that, though, is you cannot have immigration driving down wages. That defeats the entire purpose. The only way the U.S. can survive is as a high-wage economy, which it traditionally has been up until about the Kennedy assassination, when Nixon later took the U.S. dollar off uh, the Bretton Woods system, 1971, uh, and then this uh, era of low wages, globalization, and so forth, from about the 70s, the beginning of 1971, to uh, the, um, the current time. So uh, what you need is a, is a heavy-duty minimum wage. You've got to have a, at least a $15 minimum wage. Uh, a lot of people will squawk, uh, but at, what you'll have after that is a more equitable uh, distribution of such wealth as, as is produced. So with the 30 million new productive jobs paid for by 0% federal credit and modern infrastructure, you'll be able to produce wealth. And, of course, 0% for anybody who wants to do tangible physical commodity production, physical economy. Uh, to distribute it, you're going to need a $15 plus minimum wage. And the other thing you need is a revived union movement to be able to fight to secure a sufficient, uh, adequate share of that produced wealth. Once it's produced, you can then fight to uh, redistribute it in the ways that are that are necessary. So we go from a low-wage economy to a high-wage economy. But for the businessman, think of it. The cost of capital will asymptotically approach zero as this recovery takes off. Now, what's the necessary standard of living? Right? We have to think about that, too. We've got to think about primitive accumulation. What we have right now is primitive accumulation. Labor, capital, and by capital I always mean plant, equipment, infrastructure, Machines, uh, trains, uh, energy production, reactors, power plants, uh, fixed capital, constant capital. Uh, that has been underpaid, and indeed the environment has certainly been underpaid. What does it look like? There's primitive accumulation against labor. When you underpay the costs of labor, uh, and of course underpay relation to what? in relation to what is socially necessary. What is socially necessary is that a child today has got to be able to operate on the level of science and technology that will obtain at about the year 2050 or thereabouts or 2060. Uh, So the kids today have got to be gearing up for the technology that's on the horizon and over the horizon now. Uh, That's what's socially necessary. Anything less than that is primitive accumulation. It's looting. And this has to end. That would be a high-wage economy would do the job. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. On that segment, the last, it's the 11th of uh, July. So the other thing then is primitive accumulation, a low-wage economy, means that you're looting your plant equipment and your infrastructure. Obvious examples. You make a railroad into a cash cow, right? You simply don't do any maintenance or breakdown maintenance only, you run it into the ground, you suck all the money out, and then you junk it, right? You sell off the pieces, uh, plant and equipment, you don't do necessary maintenance, and you don't do necessary technological improvement. So that what you're left with is an obsolete, uh, down, run-down, degraded uh, plant. That's primitive accumulation. What we've got going now in the U.S. is a primitive accumulation or looting uh, economy. 
also environment, right? If it's easier to simply dump a bunch of toxic chemicals in a river rather than going through the necessary treatment and purification or belching smoke into the uh, atmosphere above a city without putting on the scrubbers and other things, uh, you're obviously saving money, but that's a form of primitive accumulation, and you'll pay for that as China does through the labor force. Uh, however, these have got to be real pollutants. We're not talking CO2. We're talking real heavy-duty chemical uh, pollutants. So again, the idea is you've got to have a labor force that's ready to operate at the level of the science that will exist at the midpoint of this century and in the decades after that. And you've got to be constantly upgrade, updating, upgrading your plant equipment infrastructure uh, and so forth. So that is what, uh, what will be required to develop a labor force. Otherwise, you cannot compete. You will not have a full set economy. You will become ethnographic material. So that is what this rent -a mob in Murrieta actually means. The rent -a mob in Murrieta, where we are informed by sources that a lot of these people are veterans of the Minutemen of the previous uh, decade. Uh, we're told that the former leader of that, this guy Simcox, S-Y-M-C-O-X, is now in jail awaiting trial for child molestation. So he turns out to be a monster in his own right. Simcox. Take a look at that somewhere uh, on the Internet. Now, let's also remember, as we said before, uh, Jubal Early went to Harper's Ferry on the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th of uh, July. He couldn't get any further because Franz Siegel, Siegel, S-I-G-E-L, the Union commander retreated to Maryland Heights, a big mountain with some big artillery pieces, a 100-pound uh, cannon at the very top, a 30-pound cannon a little bit further down. And Jubal Early couldn't do anything. He couldn't go directly along the Potomac to Washington as he wanted to. Had to go up to the antietam Sharpsburg battlefield, then come back down on the Maryland side. Still couldn't crack the nut at Maryland Heights. Had to leave this entire force in his rear. Then he got to Monocacy where well, we had the uh, anniversary on uh, the 9th, on Wednesday of this week. Very interesting uh, battlefield there, a little bit south of Frederick. Here, Lou Wallace came out with a ragtag force from Baltimore, was joined by one division of Army of the Potomac veterans under Ricketts, and they held off Jubal Early all day long. He lost one day, and one whole division, Gordon's division, was essentially smashed and put out of action as an effective fighting force. Then he came down, 355 Wisconsin Avenue, camped overnight, strung out, but the main group on the southern side of Gaithersburg today, northern side of Rockville, down 355, didn't go all the way down Wisconsin Avenue, turned off to the left on Beers Mill Road, went over to Fort Stevens. Now, this was an army representing slavery. If you were anybody black and they found you along the way, they would kidnap you. They would send you, keep, they would enslave you. They would send you down south. So this was an army that brought slavery. Don't ever forget it. Robert E. Lee's army was the main pillar and bulwark of slavery. It was when the uh, people in uh, Texas, slaves, Juneteenth, Juneteenth was when they heard that Lee had surrendered. That meant that slavery was indeed over. Now, why was slavery not viable? Obviously, ethically and morally, this is abhorrent, it's revolting, it's, it's horrendous. But now, from the point of view of political economy, slavery is not viable in this, for the same reasons that low-wage economies are not viable, but obviously in a, in a more concentrated form. If you have slavery, you've got primitive accumulation against your labor force, because you're literally paying them nothing. There was no education. It was, indeed, illegal to teach a slave to read and write. So if that's the level you're going to be operating on, then this means that a very large part of your labor force is already condemned to a, uh, an extremely uh, meager uh, survival level uh, of existence, right? This is obviously going nowhere. But it also means that the, the wage level in the entire society is also dragged down. You could be a skilled worker, and if they have a, 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 you know, an experienced slave laborer, 
who can come over and do the same job, then you are out and that uh, slave will be in. So it drags the entire wage structure down towards low wage. And of course, over the past 30, 40 years here in the United States, that's what we've had, the Walmart model. What does it mean? Walmart model is essentially the modernized Confederate model, that it should all be low-wage, rock-bottom, race-to-the-bottom economy. And this is why when you say, um, I noticed that the, uh, the, uh, the Ken Burns Civil War series, the Drew Gilpin Faust, Drew Gilpin Faust got to be president of Harvard based on this stuff, focuses only on the Civil War as death, and mourning and morbidity and all this, uh, it was also the necessary, as it turned out, necessary prelude to the modern world. Could have been avoided. We can talk about that another time. It was not, not inevitable. Uh, it had to do with the ability of John Quincy Adams to propose various schemes of gradual uh, emancipation, but this would have been in the 1840s and 50s. Remember Lincoln, by the time Lincoln came into office, a lot of states had already seceded just because they were obsessed with controlling the federal government. The low-wage economy is what you still have in the South. Most of the former Confederate states uh, are the leading places for poverty, child mortality, uh, lack of education, lack of health care, all the rest, right? Low wages, no unions, it's a cultural predisposition to the low-wage economy inherited in the post-slavery era when under Jim Crow and the failed Reconstruction, there was not the necessary confiscation and breakup of large Confederate states to create a class of uh, independent, prosperous, small-holding former slaves under the protection of military forces as needed. So that didn't happen. So the low-wage economy has gone on and on. Um, slavery not only accumulated against the slave, it accumulated against everybody else working for wages, because their wages were dragged down brutally. The middle class was tiny and embittered. And then it also accumulated against the farmland, right? One of the things about slavery was it had to expand. The question of expanding slavery into the territories, as the Confederates wanted to do, was uh, that uh, they destroyed the productivity of the farmland where they were. They could not put the uh, inputs, the capital improvements, the fertilizer, uh, agri uh, irrigation, transportation facilities, silos, and all the other capital improvements that go into a modern farming economy. The Confederates simply couldn't do that because they were into looting, primitive accumulation against the slave, against the middle class such as it was, and white workers, and so forth, and then against the, uh, the land. So it was like a cancer. It had to expand or it was going to die. And that is, those are the stakes in the Civil War. So what we're marking today is the last gasp. In other words, the, the obvious thing was either burn Washington on the 11th of July and have Lincoln lose the election, or... When Lincoln came out to see the battle on July 12th, and this may be apocryphal, but I still think if Oliver Wendell Holmes hadn't been there to say, get down, you fool, and they had killed him, then uh, slavery might have gone on. And it would not have ended. This ridiculous. Would not have ended. It would have been expanded all the way to Tierra del Fuego. That all would have been a joint British Confederate slave empire and the stuff had been published in the London Economist. So, uh, we'll be seeing you next week on World Crisis Radio.